Every filmmaker wants to make a great movie, but sadly the complex realities of Hollywood often make it difficult for even talented directors to do that. And of course, sometimes filmmakers just let their ego get the better of them. These directors, all of them extremely talented and some even Best Director Oscar winners, nevertheless worked against the interests of themselves, their cast, their crew, and ultimately the entire movie. Whether blinded by their own prior success, forced to make a tough creative call, or simply acting carelessly, their films suffered woefully as a result, sabotaged by their own eccentricities and misguided artistic decisions. In almost every case, it harmed the director's career forevermore, as not a single one of these filmmakers has ever really decisively redeemed themselves in the eyes of film fans. I'm Scott from WhatCulture.com, and these are nine directors who sabotaged their own movies. Number nine, Francis Ford Coppola, The Godfather Part Three. The blame for The Godfather 3's comparative failure to its predecessors can certainly be shared between Coppola's slacker direction and a pretty hokey co-written script. But what makes Coppola the saboteur of his own movie is his fatal decision to cast his own daughter Sofia as Michael Corleone's daughter Mary. Granted, the director was in a tight spot after Winona Ryder was stricken with illness last minute and had to pull out, while a whole bunch of other candidates couldn't be cast for various reasons. Julia Roberts had scheduling conflicts, Madonna being almost 15 years older than Ryder would have required a substantial rewrite, and up-and-comer Rebecca Schaefer was tragically murdered by a stalker the day that she was supposed to meet Coppola for the part. In a panic, Coppola settled on Sophia, and her infamously shambolic performance tanked every scene she was in, especially her climactic, atrociously acted death. Coppola ultimately won two Razzie Awards for her role in the film, Worst Supporting Actress and Worst New Star of 1990. Number 8. M. Night Shyamalan – Glass Remember when M. Night Shyamalan was the guy in Hollywood? That initial rise was followed by a brutal spate of disappointments and flops across the mid-2000s through to the early 2010s. Then the filmmaker managed to make his comeback with back-to-back -back successes of The Visit and Split, the latter of which left everyone amped for his planned unbreakable slash split sequel, Glass. On paper, everything seemed set for Shyamalan to cement his comeback. But in making screenwriting decisions so hilariously, frustratingly wrong-headed in Glass, he once again proved to be his own worst enemy. Glass underwhelmed fans of both Unbreakable and Split, with its deeply unsatisfying ending where all three superpowered characters are killed, two of them in extremely anticlimactic fashion, destroying a potential franchise in the process. Shyamalan's expectation-defying final twist simply felt like the director repeating his earlier career mistakes, namely relying overtly on shock value to propel memorability over story. Number 7. Woody Allen – A Rainy Day in New York Woody Allen shot his new romantic comedy A Rainy Day in New York in late 2017, with Amazon Studios set to distribute. In summer 2018, though, they terminated his contract and shelved the film as a result of Allen's tone-deaf comments on the Me Too movement, bringing renewed attention towards already noted sexual abuse allegations from his past. In a statement, Amazon said that Allen made a series of public comments suggesting that he failed to grasp the gravity of the issues or the implications for his own career. Allen infamously criticized the witch hunt potential of Me Too, while expressing tacit sympathy for Harvey Weinstein and calling himself a poster boy for the movement. This then prompted many of the film's cast members to donate their salaries to anti-sexual assault organizations and insist that they would never work with Allen again. Number 6. Rennie Harlan – Cutthroat Island A flaming wreck with its architect standing gleefully in front of it. What an apt metaphor that is for the calamitous seafaring production that was 1995's action-adventure dud, Cutthroat Island. Now, there are many, many reasons as to why the $98 million tentpole bombed so critically and commercially, grossing just $10 million worldwide, but the lion's share of the blame absolutely lies with director Rennie Harlan. Fresh off directing back-to-back -back box office hits Die Hard 2 and Cliffhanger, Harlan convinced producers to hire his then-girlfriend Gina Davis, not known for her action roles as the female lead. That male lead role was then turned down by practically every bankable A-list actor in Hollywood, until Harlan settled on Matthew Modine. But Harlan wasted so much time finding his leading man that pre-production and script work were done without his oversight. And when he hated what had been done, set rebuilds and script rewrites helped bloat the initial $60 million budget all the way out. Rennie even spent $1 million of his own cash to finish the script as things spiraled completely out of control. Elsewhere, Rennie Harlan fired the chief camera operator following an argument, leading to more than two dozen crew members quitting in solidarity. Lastly, he insisted that cast members perform all of their own stunts, meaning that outside of the health and safety risks, the overall stock of film was burned through at a ridiculous rate. Number 5. Martin Campbell – Green Lantern DC's Green Lantern movie is infamous for being rather naff, though the explanation behind why is more than just a lack of skill. 
See, director Martin Campbell wanted Bradley Cooper in the lead role, and was more than a bit miffed when Warner Brothers cast Ryan Reynolds without telling him. As a result, Campbell and Reynolds struggled to work together, with Campbell routinely picking the actor's performance apart and requesting an excessive number of retakes. This ultimately led to Reynolds stating he was relieved at the film's failure because he dreaded the idea of doing a sequel with Campbell at the helm. Martin's attitude clearly affected the overall quality of the film, as extensive reshoots were ordered several months from release. Fearing that they had a director running amok, Warner Brothers then took the final cut away from him. In recent years, Campbell has called the film a failure, admitting that the project was poorly conceived from the get-go. But on the other hand, you could have just made an effort to work with one of the most dependable actors in Hollywood. Number 4. George Lucas – The Star Wars Prequels When George Lucas made Star Wars The Phantom Menace, he hadn't directed a film since A New Hope 22 years prior, only doing so after Robert Zemeckis, Steven Spielberg, and Ron Howard all turned the movies down. With their encouragement, he ventured back into the world of filmmaking, and fans couldn't wait to see what wonders Lucas would cook up this time. Well, old George did himself no favors by deciding to innovate with experimental new digital filmmaking technology. What became an obsession with blue screen effects gave all three prequels a depressingly artificial look, one that ran counter to the more tactile experience of the original films. It's painfully clear from behind-the-scenes footage that Lucas needed a fearless colleague to bounce ideas off, but by confidently forging ahead with Yes Men in tow and more money than God, he set himself up for epic failure. Between his garish over-reliance on cutting-edge CGI filmmaking and overconfidence in his own ideas, not to mention an unfathomable amount of hype the trilogy could never really live up to, Lucas was kinda doomed from the start. Number 3. Jerry Lewis – The Day the Clown Cried the Day the Clown Cried is one of the most famous unreleased movies of all time. A Holocaust drama shot in 1972 starring Jerry Lewis as a circus clown imprisoned within a Nazi concentration camp, he decides to try and entertain the children held there to at least distract them from their eventual fate. Lewis took the role extremely seriously, shedding £35 in six weeks to play the emaciated clown, yet the film was initially not released due to ongoing rights issues regarding distribution. Still, despite his earnest intentions, Lewis turned on the film in subsequent years, claiming to be, and I quote, "...embarrassed at the poor work." and repeatedly telling reporters that it would never see the light of day as a result. Lewis reportedly donated a copy of the film to the Library of Congress in 2015, under the stipulation that it not be screened until June 2024. Though with Lewis's death in 2017, interest has been renewed in his estate, possibly taking a more diplomatic approach to releasing what remains of the film. All sorts of apocryphal stories have done the rounds over the years as to actors and filmmakers who claim to have seen various bootleg copies of this film, and some scanned footage has made its way online. But between Lewis's failure to figure out the tangle of rights and his subsequent disdain for the end result, this potentially ahead of its time comedy slash drama never stood a chance. Number 2. Michael Cimino, Heaven's Gate Hot off the Best Picture and Best Director winning The Deer Hunter, director Michael Cimino was effectively given carte blanche to helm his self penned 1980 western, Heaven's Gate. And in a textbook example of a director going crazy, the film ran massively over schedule and way over budget. As some examples, Semino had a specifically built street torn down and remade because it quote, didn't look right, and shot over 220 hours of footage, costing the studio $200,000 per day in just production fees. There were even reports that Semino changed the locks on the editing suite to prevent executives from checking up on him. Semino's first rough cut was 5 hours and 25 minutes long, and after the studio naturally balked at such a length, he did manage to cut it down by almost 2 hours. Then, following a disastrous premiere, the film was pulled from release for even more re-editing. In the end, the $44 million film grossed just $3.5 million. It was panned by critics, and just to top things off, it killed Semino's reputation dead overnight. Number 1. Josh Trank Fantastic Four It's fair to say that the various stories of the troubled Fantastic Four reboot are way more interesting than the film itself. Director Josh Trank, hot off the success of Chronicle, seemed like an inspired choice with a unique vision. And though Trank insists that Fox ripped creative control of the project away from him, numerous sources have stated that Trank was a drug-addled, uncommunicating mess during production, even dealing damage to accommodation that was rented for him. According to these reports, he was struggling under the weight of helming such a huge-scale project. Furthermore, he reportedly had an antagonistic working relationship with star Kate Mara, who was a studio-mandated casting, and he very nearly came to blows with co-star Miles Teller as a result. Even with a massively negative wave of PR against the film in the weeks leading to its release, Trank dealt the killing blow himself by criticizing the final cut on Twitter a day before it came out in the US, kinda placing a cap on the utter shambles that was the film's production. Now, it is entirely possible that Trank had a smart vision for a Cronenberg-inspired horror take on the Fantastic Four, though we can see 
so little of that in the final cut, one which apparently had to be wrestled away from him because he was so difficult for the cast and crew to deal with. Fox certainly shares some of the blame here, even if only for giving a $155 million budget to someone who hasn't even worked with one tenth of that before, but it's very clear that Josh Trank himself burned out under the pressure. And that is my list. Let me know your own stories of directorial self-destruction down in the comments below. Ivan Scott from whatculture.com and I'll catch you soon.